Good afternoon to all, and welcome to the final session of today's conference. Uh, as we have been saying that uh, this year marks the 100 years of Shimla Convention, and since this morning we have been listening to various uh, speakers speaking on different perspectives on Shimla Convention. And this session is no different as we will listen to British perspective. And now we have a session, uh, we have a speaker, uh, Mr. Tenzin Norge, who is the research fellow at Tibet Policy Institute, and he will speak on view from Britain in the Great Game. He will speak for 30 minutes and will uh, take question and answer after afterwards. Allow me to introduce Mr. Norge. Tenzin Norge, currently a fellow at the Tibet Policy Institute, is a curious thinker and a keen student of international affairs. Prior to joining TPI, Mr. Norge worked at the Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy for eight years, researching about the human rights situation in Tibet and as the center's personnel for UN affairs. Between 2011 to 2013, Mr. Norge mm -hmm did his graduate studies in international affairs at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, Tuff University. By education, he is a Master of Arts in Law and Diplomacy. He holds his bachelor's degree from the University of Delhi. Mr. Noge has participated in various international forums, World Social Forum, Mumbai 2004, the World Forum for Democra Democratization in Asia, Tapai 2005, U UN Human Rights Council, Geneva 2007 and 2009, just to name a few. He has also spoken extensively to the international media regarding Tibet. <coughs> Mr. Norge likes to read and think, think critically and provocatively. With this, now I would like to request Nogela to please begin your presentation. had uh, a lot of discussion uh, since this morning. Uh, so my task is to talk about this conference uh, from the British perspective. Uh, hence my title, uh, Tibet in the Great Game uh, and the view from Britain. I think like uh, I'm not going this uh, you know, like uh, from the entire uh, events that un uh, unfolded in the early 20th century, it's quite obvious that the the goal of the uh, goal of Imperial Britain uh, was to check the expansion of uh, the Russian Empire, and uh, through their own uh, various uh, tools. Uh, the objectives were mainly to secure the Indo-Tibet uh, frontier and uh, create buffer zone between Russia and British India through diplomatic uh, negotiation. And of course, uh, use recognition status as a carrot to bring China to the negotiating uh, table and establish a British, uh, British India's presence in Tibet to check up on the Russians. Uh, before I move further, I think I need to set the stage uh, at this particular era, what was like actually happening? And the, the interesting, <coughs> there, like uh, I would go into this three uh, background uh, titles, like the frontiers. You know, we have to, in a way, understand what is a frontier, and uh, in a way, also understand what is a border. So, frontier is, in a way, a vague boundary which is not legally defined, and border is like legally defined line which is like says this is your territory this is your territory but frontier is very kind of uh, uh, like you know very vague in that sense uh, <coughs> this is, I mean it's quite a dense task text uh, but I think we can only focus on the highlighted parts it's actually a, a speech is uh, given by the Viceroy of British India Lord Curzon uh, while he was in England uh, in 1907, so it, this was like a text that he uh, speech that he de delivered in England in 1907. 
One of the thing, interesting thing, you know, about the Shimla Convention is that, you know, before the Shimla Convention, there are also uh, conventions rela relating to Tibet. And even after that, there are conventions relating to Tibet. And there's a lot of conflicting uh, articles in those. So if you uh, read those documents, uh, just to you know, like uh, show you what those, some of those documents are like, you know, there were this convention between Great Britain and China relating to Sikkim and Tibet in, signed in 1890. Then again, between uh, Great Britain and Tibet in 1904, right after the Young Husband's mission and uh, you know, convention Britain and China respecting Tibet, then between Britain and Russia. So this is where we are interested in today's conference. But obviously we also, ha in order to read this document, we have to understand what had happened in the past. And, uh, but I will not really go into the later part of this conference because I think uh, Professor Bhattacharya has uh, given a very a uh, superb uh, presentation of what actually happened after the McMahon line, so how the p Chinese perceived it and how uh, things have uh, shaped up so far. So frontiers, like, you know, like, uh, <coughs> from our Tibetan perspective, it's like the British have been uh, was viewed as a threat uh, to the Tibetan uh, government. So ever since the British uh, and the Chinese government concluded the convention regarding Sikkim, whereby uh, Sikkim was recognized as a protectorate of uh, British India, uh, the Tibetans were not really happy. You know, in the Tibetan government's mind, it forms a part of the Tibetan territory. So they were sending these troops to defend the post to basically kick out uh, the British uh, soldiers manning these areas. So in a way, that's how uh, uh, Young Husband's uh, mission was uh, undertaken. Because the, when, whenever Lord Curzon, he, in a way, uh, tried to communicate with the 13th Dalai Lama, his communications were always returned unopened uh, back to him. So he was like not able to make a direct communication with him. And then, of course, at the same time, uh, there were like Tibetan troops who were coming uh, to defend their post. So there was a lot of, you know, like after Young Husband's mission to Tibet, when, in a way, the uh, convention between Tibet and Great Britain was signed in 1904, uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, it generated, in a way, a lot of uh, criticism from the British public on how the uh, British Indian uh, soldiers went into Tibet with, with 3,000 soldiers fought and you know, uh, badly defeated the Tibetan troops and imposed uh, indemnity of about, at that time, 500,000 uh, pounds. That was in 1904. So in today's currency, in 2013 value, it would be about uh, 78 million US dollars. So in a way, the British uh, public were not, ha not like really happy with what has happened. So this is what uh, Lord Curzon had to say in his speech. Uh, you know, ever since they, and not we, assumed the aggressive and first invaded British territory 18 years ago, and still less could be acquiesce in this treatment at the very time when this young and, p and perverse ruler of Tibet, uh, that's the third Dalai Lama, who it seems to me has shown himself to be the evil genius of his people while refusing to hold any communication with us or even uh, rec uh, receive letters from the representative of the British sovereign. Uh, was, uh, was conducting communications with another great power, which was like Russia, uh, situated not at his doors, but at a great distance away, and was co courting its protection. I was sent to India, among other objects, to guard the frontier of India, and I've done it. You know, the British, the Tibetans feared the British Indians, uh, British Raj, and uh, the British Viceroy uh, Curzon, he, in a way, uh, was suspicious of an alignment, alliance being formed between Tibet and Russia. Because in early 1900s, just as uh, Chick Miller, he mentioned in his uh, presentation, uh, there were, like, in fact, two uh, Tibetan uh, delegations who visited uh, the Tsarist Russia. And it, in a way, 
uh, the media uh, portrayed those in a way like missions sent by the 13th Dalai Lama and led by Dojiev. So these media like reports in a way confirmed uh, the British uh, suspicion that the Tibetans are forming some sort of alliance with the Russians. So uh, that was like the job of uh, Viceroy Curzon to defend his frontier. And I think like also like we have to think uh, what was the British thinking at that time? And I think this particular text again uh, very much highlights what the British were thinking at that time. I hope that as a result of these operations, we shall be able to introduce some measure of enlightenment into that miserable and monk written country, and without adding to our own responsibilities, which the government of India are without the least wish to extend, that we shall be able to ward off a source of political unrest and intrigue on this section of our border, gradually to build up, and as I believe it to be in our power to do. In a way, like uh, they didn't want to uh, bring Tibet under the British rule because it would be expensive for them to, the, the, if you do a cost benefit analysis, uh, there was much, uh, not much of a return if you bring Tibet uh, under the British protectorate. <coughs> so um, the reason I'm bringing this is like, you know, because many of the Tibetans also have this uh, perception that the British tried to. Uh, you know, bring Tibet under its uh, empire, uh, and uh, from my understanding, it is uh, not the so, not not the case. So, like, what was the British strategy then? You know, in a way, like again, in this very uh, <coughs> lecture, Lord Curzon, they wanted to create. Tibet as a buffer state, buffer zone in that sense, like you know, for both the uh, Russians and the British to keep their hands <laughs> off, so that you know they don't <coughs> come into direct contact with each other. I think before I read into this, I think we have to maybe it would be much better if I show these kind of images. Uh, this is uh, the Russian Empire, which what it <coughs> looks like. Uh, in around 1866, uh, right? So Russia is a huge uh, land power, and it it's a like a continental power in that sense. And then this was what the British Empire looked like at the height of its empire. Of course, uh, by 1900s, uh, New England part of the United States and all this were all like you know decolonized, and became independent nations and all. But uh, the purpose over here is to show what it looked like, right? Because <coughs> the British were at the end of the day they were the sea power, and the Russians they were the land power. And one very interesting theory. That was proposed by Sir Harful Mackenda in 1904. Was this? Uh, it's, it's published in the uh, geog uh, in the Oxford uh, Geographical Journal or something like that. I don't remember exactly, uh, but he he titled it "Geographical Pivot of History," and according to him, like he's a great uh, uh, geopolitical uh, thinker and strategist. According to Mackinder, whoever controls the Central Asian zone will have access to the inner or the marginal crescent, the other states lying around here, right? <coughs> and uh, because uh, Russia is a land power and it has already stretched a lot in terms of its empire, if they gain access to these, they control these, they will gain access to the sea, right? And in Mackinder's thinking, the United States is, a, is an island in that sense. So if you gain access to the sea, you control the whole world. A land power controlling these peripheral marginal crescent uh, states, getting access to the sea, control these, that means you, you rule the world. So the, uh, I think like this is another image, which is not exactly what uh, uh, 
Mackinder showed, but uh, it in a way like serves our purpose to think uh, how he, you know, like saw it in that sense. Like this land power, if you get control over here, you get control to the sea, and then again you rule the world. So, you know, Mackinder, in a way, he was quite right. He said that. You know, as much as long as the empires can expand, right? You don't come in a direct contact, and thereby you avoid a war or a, con a conflict. But as soon as, around like the uh, uh, early uh, 20th century, the limits of empire were already being reached. There was no way that you know, unless you uh, expand further, and then uh, you are in a way in direct contact, and uh, you go to war and. First World War is exactly all about that. So they didn't really want to come in direct contact with the uh, Russian Empire and you know cause a war. So there was this uh, thinking of creating strategic you know like buffer zones all around. So you know in the in the words of uh, Lord Curzon, a buffer zone, as commonly understood, that is the country possessing a national existence of its own, which is <coughs> fortified by the territorial and political guarantee, either by the two powers between whose dominions it lies and by whom it would otherwise inevitably be crushed, or of a number of great powers interested in the preservation of the status quo. So that was like the thinking. You, you, they wanted to create a buffer zone between the Tibet, uh, uh, between the Russian Empire and the British uh, India. And it, like again, like the British thinking was that again, I've underlined this uh, again heavily. Uh, like the, 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 he's he actually talking about the agreement between, uh, yeah, between the, uh, the Russians and the British, and the sa he says like the same agreement contains a further novelty in international diplomacy, in the shape of a neutralizing pledge about Tibet made by the two powers one of which is contiguous, while the other has no territorial contact, whatever, with that country. So, of course, British does not have like ter contiguous territorial uh, contact with uh, Tibet. So Tibet is not a buffer state between Great Britain and Russia. The circle of the recent expedition has merely, he's talking about the Young Husband mission, uh, has merely been to make it again what it had literally ceased to be, namely a mark or frontier protectorate of the Chinese Empire. So in a way, they recognize that it is part of, Tibet is part of the Chinese Empire. But uh, because of the uh, geopolitical situation, they, the immediate concern was uh, the Russian Empire, and they wanted to create Tibet as a buffer zone so that they don't uh, come into direct contact, and you know, which might, in a way, lead to some war. And yet, at the same time, the Chinese also have a, an empire uh, mind. Is also, you know, works out like an empire. Uh, this is one map that I found on the internet. Uh, that uh, I don't read uh, Chinese, but I asked my colleague, you know, what does it say? And he said, like, it says uh, the lost territories of uh, China. So, in, according to the Chinese thinking. Like the furthest of their extension of their empire, they consider it their territory, all right? And this is like the mainland heartland, and then the outer circle, and then the out, outer outer circle. And uh, today you have the whole South China Sea problem, and uh, this is the Chinese thinking that you know it forms a part of the Chinese empire since thousands of years ago, and that that's why they're making the claim uh, in the South China Sea. So in a way, like, uh, in they think in terms of three concentric circles, like China over here. As you know, China is call officially called Tungo, which is like the Middle Kingdom. And then you have the outer circle, which is like uh, uh, the East Asian states, uh, uh, like uh, Korea, Vietnam, uh, you know, um, who else, like 
wherever like the, the tribute paying uh, states to the Middle Kingdom those times. And then you have uh, the outer, outer ring, which in a way stretches over here. Like, so they think, uh, the thinking is the part of the uh, Indian uh, state today, like Arunachal Pradesh and Aksai Chin and all, in a way belongs uh, to China. So this is the official thinking, I mean like uh, the Chinese uh, thinking. And in a way, I think we can call it now today, uh, the Chinese policy makers, most of them are driven by the ancient Chinese thoughts. So for many of uh, us who are interested in uh, research areas, it, it would be very, very interesting for us to read the Chinese classics uh, to see, uh, you know, like to really dissect the Chinese mind and try to see uh, how can we, in a way, uh, for our own interests, uh, whether we want to resolve or escalate or whatever, you know. So it, it is very important for us to see, uh, dissect the Chinese mind. So I think, like, uh, I'll now come to the Shimla Convention. <coughs> if you remember, uh, the 13th Dalai Lama, he fled, first fled to uh, Mongolia, and then returned to Tibet, to Lhasa, in 1909. And by the time he returned, uh, after, of course, uh, visiting uh, Empress Dowager, uh, by the time he returned, like, the Chinese, uh, like, you know, uh, there's this guy, uh, Tao Fang, the uh, special commissioner, you know, his title was something like that. But in a way, like, he was like a military uh, leader. And he had already advanced into the Eastern Tibet part, like the, what we call as Kham. And it was, in a way, uh, making it, trying to make thinking to move forward into Tibet proper, the Lhasa uh, area, and then bring it under its control. So even when he had uh, advanced successfully in the Kham area, uh, he proposed that, you know, it was it's already under his control. He was communicating with the imperial government, um, with the government, and he ha he was in a way uh, uh, proposing it to, um, you know, the the government to make it a new province called Shikang, which in a way means uh, Western Kham. So that was his proposal. So at the same time, the Tibetan government was not really happy with this advanced and has already in, uh, started to take arms and engage in armed hostilities. And uh, that's the immediate background that we have to understand in understanding the Shimla Convention. And uh, so if the uh, Tower of Fang is able to successfully able to get into uh, proper Tibet and get, hold, get control of it, uh, British India's uh, frontier security is in peril. So the British uh, does have an interest over here to maintain the status quo, and uh, that's how they uh, started this convention, uh, Shimla Convention. So, you know, as you know, the Chinese, they, they didn't want to come to this uh, negotiating table, because to come to this would be to acknowledge Tibet as an equal uh, partner. So. But at the same time, at the end of the day, they came over here uh, because the British threatened that, you know, if they don't come to Simla, they will uh, not recognize uh, Yon Shikai's government. So as you know, in 1911, the Imperial Qing government collapsed and Yon Shikai was uh, declared the president. And uh, but still then, like the recognition uh, status was lingering. So just uh, before the Simla conference, uh, the British and uh, other 13 great powers, uh, in a way, uh, restored, uh, recognized the uh, Yon Shikai's government. So it was this recognition carrot that brought uh, Yon Shikai's uh, uh, negotiator uh, to Shimla. So Shimla Convention, if you look, it spreads out into eight formal sessions. 
some of the scholars, some of the researchers, they say it started, no, it's not from 13 October, it starts from 6 October, but on 6 October, it, nothing really happened. It was just like reception, you know, uh, if you think like in our terms, the day when the participants register their name, you know, say I'm here. So that nothing substantive happened. So these were the uh, way the formal discussions were. And, uh, and of course, there were innumerable uh, informal uh, sessions taking place. So on the first two s formal sessions, there were claims and counterclaims made between the Tibetan government and the, uh, uh, the Chinese government. Uh, the Chinese government, in a way, made the claim that because Tower Fang had already uh, advanced much earlier uh, and you know, had already uh, under his control Eastern Tibet, uh, the argument was it has always been part of uh, what we now know as know as Inner Tibet. Uh, it has always been part of the Chinese uh, uh, Qing, uh, sorry, uh, Imperial government. And to prove it, he said, like, you know, there was this uh, pillar at Batang County. And uh, he said, like, this is the pillar which marks the uh, border, in a way, like frontier between uh, the Tibetan government and the uh, Chinese government. And uh, on the other hand, Lunjin Shata, he produced a lot of documentary evidence saying, like, you know, like, you cannot really uh, bring a pillar as an evidence. And he has the documentary evidence. He showed a lot of evidence in the form of uh, tax receipts, like, you know, and other uh, government, Tibetan government uh, orders to the areas over he there. And, uh, you know, uh, there were, in a way, a lot of uh, documentary evidence. And you can make it out from MacMahon's um, notes that, obviously, uh, Lin Shata outclassed Ivan Chen, uh, you know, like, in terms of producing the documents. Uh, and also, like, uh, to be fair, Ivan Chen was, like, you know, appointed as the negotiator uh, at a very late stage, so he was not really prepared in that sense. He was working at, uh, he had worked at uh, the Chinese legation in, Brit in London, and then, you know, he had come back to China. Uh, he was, in a way, uh, <coughs> engaged in some other negotiations uh, back home in China. But he didn't really want to go over here to this negotiating table. And, uh, you know, he arrived at this conference at the very late, like just uh, like, you know, a day uh, before the conference started. Uh, while, on the other hand, Lunji Shada, he was a seasoned diplomat. He had been residing in uh, India for a long time. He had been observing uh, the British uh, uh, moves in India. And uh, so he was very well prepared when he came over here. And he had lots of documents with him. But I think, like, you know, yeah, so this map, uh, in a way, allows us to understand what was in contention at that time. Uh, This is the frontier of Tibet that was claimed by the Tibetans. It stretches over here to Sinning, Chengdu, all this area. And this is what uh, the Chinese government was saying, this is Tibet and not this, right? Only this part. Like the line was somewhere around uh, Yamda and all. And uh, so this is what uh, the frontier of Tibet was proposed in the Shimla conf uh, conference. Uh, so the fact of the matter at that time was Tower Fang had already under his control the eastern part of Tibet. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the documentary evidences were 
highly in favor of the Tibetan government. You know, but as a, as a mediator, the British, because the aim of the conference was to, you know, end the hostilities between the Tibetan government and uh, Tower Fang's troops. There were a lot of fighting going on. So his aim, immediate aim was to end the hostilities. Uh, you know, uh, and so this is like how he drew the line, right? It was, uh, as we have seen earlier in the first two uh, sessions, it was they were trying to, in a way, find out the limits of Tibet. You know, t the territorial limits of Tibet. So, like both sides had good arguments. Uh, so MacMahon, in a way, in order to you know end the hostilities, he came up with this idea of the red line and the blue line, and this area is like the uh, inner Tibet, and this is like the outer Tibet. So, you know, politics is all about control. And uh, at that particular uh, day, situation, Tower Fang was in control of Eastern Tibet. So he, in a way, acknowledged that uh, this is the only frontier of Tibet which is under the control of the Tibetan uh, Lhasa government. But he also acknowledged that the Tibetan Lhasa government's uh, authority is nomina nominally recognized in the inner Tibet region also. And uh, uh, the, uh, the others, uh, you know, like, uh, the, on the other hand, he acknowledged that the Chinese government has control over here but it has nominal control over here, right? So it's like a uh, trying to be a honest broker, uh, you know, recognizing the facts on the ground, and uh, coming out with a solution. <coughs> you know, if you look into the earlier conventions, also uh, the relationship between Tibet and Ch and China was functioning at a very, uh, how do you say, in the eyes of the Westerners, a weird kind of relationship was there. Neither full sovereignty, no like, full ind independence. It was very weird. So the British, in order to you know, like, um, make sense of what it is, the relationship, they call it suzerainty, right? Suzerainty, in a way, uh, is a medieval European concept. I have this, uh, oops, this to bring from Professor Dawa Nubu's book, China's Tibet Policy, uh, University of uh, Durham. And he says, like, you know, such an official use of suzerain to describe a complex relationship is unfortunate, but the British thought that it was the most appropriate term for the traditional Sino-Tibetan relations. No. Etymologically, it was used in the Middle Ages to describe the relation between a feudal lord and his vessel. The suzerain relationship implied that the vessel had to perform every year an act of homage and submission to the suzerain. Uh, he had to pay a tribute to suzerain. Uh, he had to serve the emperor with uh, soldiers in times of war and emergency. And the suzerainty granted a subsidy or pension uh, to the vessel. So it's like. Even before the Simla conference, uh, as you recall, the Young Husband mission in 1904 and the resulting uh, convention between Great Britain and Tibet, uh, the British imposed uh, indemnity of 500,000 pounds, as I said earlier. And who paid it, right? Uh, it was not the Lhasa government who paid that indemnity. The, uh, the, the, the imperial government paid it. So. Uh, you know, this is like a kind of a weird thing that was going on. So that's like how the British understood this complex relationship between the Tibetans and the Chinese. So, you know, the, his proposal of inner and outer Tibet Lung Chen Shetha was quite happy with that because his, his aim also was to, you know, at the end of the day, to end the Chinese aggression 
and uh, stabilize the Tibetan frontiers. And uh, but uh, Ivan Chen, under his inst uh, under instruction from his government, he was not happy. To them, to the Chinese government, this especially this article, article number nine in the Shimla Convention is the bone of contention. The very reason why uh, Ivan Chen and the Chinese government did not sign this agreement. Because this recognizes for the purpose of the present convention, the borders of Tibet and the boundary between outer and inner Tibet shall be shown in red and blue, respectively, on the map attached here to. And nothing in the present convention shall be held to prejudice the existing right of the Tibetan government in inner Tibet, which include the power to select and appoint the high priests of monasteries and to retain full control in all matters affecting religious institutions. So the Chinese, Ivan Chen and the Chinese government were not happy with this. Again, if you recall, we hear in eight, eight uh, session, formal sessions, uh, on this date, 27 April 1914, uh, Uh, the three parties, uh, the three negotiators, uh, signed the document, including Ivan Chen. Uh, because Ivan Chen, he was in a way making his, uh, taking his discretionary power uh, to come to some sort of a conclusion. But on 29 April 1914, just two days later, uh, under the instruction of uh, the, uh, the the government, uh, you know that. Oh, sorry. Uh, the uh, Waiwapu, which is like uh, the uh, foreign ministry of the Chinese government, uh, repudiated Ivan Chen's signature, saying we do not accept this. So you know, this is there is a gap of about two months in between. So between these two months. Lord, uh, sorry, uh, Sir Henry McMahon was trying to bring to some uh, consensus. And he was trying to, in a way, uh, assure uh, Ivan Chen and the, uh, uh, the central government in that sense that, you know, we are acknowledging the sovereignty of China over Tibet. And I in order to uh, bring them to a consensus they made like uh, s several notes right these were the, these, these were the seven notes uh, that were hammered in between but it's understood that by high contracting parties that Tibet forms part of Chinese territory it was in order to you know make Ivan Chen and the, and the central government sign this document and after the selection of the inst Installation of the Dalai Lama, earlier it, it read uh, appointment, and later it was changed to installation of the Dalai Lama by the Tibetan government. The later will notify the installation to the Chinese government whose representative, uh, you know, um, yeah. So I think like uh, uh, you, you can read this text, it's easily available on the internet, on Tibet Justice Center's uh, website. But Uh, there were a lot of talks going on back and forth, and uh, but at the same time, um, Henry McMahon knows that the Chinese have this nasty procrastinating strategy always behind their back. They always procrastinate and never finalize the documents. So he had to, in a way, bring the whole conference into some sort of a conclusion. So he gave, uh, came up with this final deadline and uh, asking Ivan Chen to get the consent of his government so that we can conclude this uh, conference. And you can see it from here, the last formal session, it happened in the night, you know, middle of the night. In a way, they were trying to accommodate Ivan Chen to receive instructions from the central government, you know, so that you know, he can sign this, finalize this conference and the document. But even though they waited and waited and waited, uh, 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 Ivan Chen never received this instruction from his government. So, uh, Young, uh, sorry, McMahon and uh, Nunja Shara went ahead uh, 
uh, with the uh, with the convention, uh, but that uh, they made a small uh, change. In a way, this was also uh, to uh, take into consideration the Russian concerns also. The Article 10. This was what was adopted between uh, McMahon and Lindy Shatter. And this was what was actually in the uh, draft convention. So in the draft convention, Article 10 reads, like in a way, it gives the British a mediating role. As far as I come, it engages them to, you know, in refer them to the uh, British government for equitable adjustment. The British thinking was that, you know, uh, because the Russians already had, remember, there is a convention between Russia and um, Great Britain in 1907, way by they said, let's keep our hands off Tibet. And at the same time, through this uh, agreement, you know, the Russians and others could easily see that the British presence is going to get stronger in Tibet. So, but MacMahon's reasoning was, because the Russians, they already have an agreement with the Mongolians, and you know, they also have uh, some sort of a, uh, a role as an arbitrator over there. Why not us, you know, in this convention as a mediator? But then the Russians never listened. So under the instruction of uh, his government in London, he had to change this, and this was adopted. So, two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I think like, uh, on the whole, the final convention was signed between, only between uh, the British government and uh, Tibet, and uh, China uh, kept out of it. So, you know, uh, that's the legacy. And uh, that's, and I if you read the, later part after 1914, uh, it's uh, also we have to remember 1914, the First World War took place, right? And that l led to the decline of the British power. Uh, there were no consensus coming about on this convention. The British government was very trying very hard to make the uh, Chinese even afterwards to, okay, now let's have a consensus, but uh, the Chinese never listened. So I think, yeah, I will uh, stop over here. That's the end of my slides. Uh, thank you, Nargila, for your wonderful presentation. Now I request the audience to raise questions, and please be brief and clear. Uh, yeah, let me just... Uh, say that this work is much in progress. I'm not a historian, but uh, I would, I'm looking at it in terms of uh, international law and also in terms of uh, uh, diplomacy. So it's very much a work in progress, but I hope I'm able to answer some of your tough questions. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, thank you, Nogila. Actually, uh, I, I already asked this question to him uh, during the rehearsal presentation at the TPI. Uh, I think it's important to uh, uh, know what I'm going to ask to him. Uh, I believe uh, many among uh, us, including me, thinks that uh, uh, the great Thardin Dalai Lama uh, declared uh, independence uh, Tibet in 1913. And after one year, he sent uh, a delegation to Simla for the uh, uh, conference between th these three uh, interested parties. So could you, uh, it's really you know, beneficial, could you please uh, you know, uh, make sense out of this uh, uh, you know, contradiction? Yeah, it's true that many of us in the Tibetan community uh, we believe that the Thirteen Dalai Lama declared independence in 1913, uh, the Declaration of Independence that we talk about. But having said so, it's doubtful whether that is actually a Declaration of Independence or not. If you read the text of the of that particular declaration, in that sense, 
to me, like it reads more like a report of the Dalai Lama saying, "I've come back, you know, uh, no need to fear, and uh, we have now uh, kicked out the Chinese, and uh, you should uh, build monasteries, abide by the Buddhist principles, you know." So, I, in fact, I have the document here. Uh, can I just have a small poll over here? How many of you have you read the Declaration of Independence document? I think like four or five. So where is this whole thing coming from, right? The first one, I think like two, uh, shall I say claim? It has a Declaration of Independence. I think we can, cite, we can see many of the citations to uh, Shakapa's uh, political history of Tibet, right? So that's a secondary source. You have to go into the primary source. And uh, if you look into that uh, document, at least to me, I don't know about you people, but uh, it doesn't really read like a Declaration of Independence, you know? Uh, but perhaps at that time, uh, because the Tibetans have been uh, saying in this um, isolationist mode for about 150 or 200 years, uh, you know, they might have thought uh, that this serves as a, as a uh, declaration of independence. But to any uh, one with an academic eye or uh, unbiased or a third person, uh, if you ask someone to read it and, you know, like say what it means, I mean, I, I, I really doubt whether they will say it's a declaration of independence. And if you, you can also make comparisons between, between a lot of other uh, uh, such documents, you know, in the uh, era of uh, the decolonization, many other uh, nation states also made their declarations. So uh, in, com in, in comparing the documents, you know, again, there's a lot of uh, skepticism. Uh, at the same time, one thing very important is this. The Tibetans have their own sense of uh, independence, which is like not really compatible with the, uh, you know, like uh, the concept of the nation state, kind of uh, Westphalian concept thinking. In mid 1700s, uh, the Tibetan government, in order to uh, fight the Nepalese and the Dogras, invited uh, military troops from the imperial government, not one time, not two times, not three, not three times, not four times, five times. In a way, you give your political independence in that sense. Again, in 1904, if you remember now, the uh, Young Husband indemnity was again paid by the imperial government. You know, so in terms of if you are an independent state, you should have your own defense, security forces, you should have your own like uh, economy, and then but through your economy, you should be able to uh, you know, better the lives of your people. So it would be, uh, for me at least, uh, I don't really consider that a, a declaration of independence. Uh, perhaps, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know about your opinion, but uh, this is my personal opinion. Tandasila 
jinse tso da da pna ngel ranze tsama ye lasati yami getel ta chwa manda wa jil ten tena yongi chuare pe yona te jinse jinda chil tena yongi chuare lai ah tamwa chwa tamwa tu chu chu ra tadi eh tamdi di sansam di korti ta tande pyo rang jung jung lai gi sansam di sam tangi ina shimna chi kapsu khanje ta chwa di khari ba dawdi yor ta che sa tande ngazu gi sam tangi ina Umelam Umelam ki ta go to the quarter low and she not see relevant to your sorry, she not see the chile ticking at this caledia. A similar to do land is a similar agreement. A chess and dick up to that to do tune a take what he made the that Tande Chalot Nedo Nedo Doji or the machine did similar to do ki cone something in. ติดจิกตงกุบจะชุบชิกิดรวาจิกตงกุบจะซุ่มเดวานี่ขันเจคุณสุอินจีกิเอ่อชิมจูชิงเอตาเดคุณสุกิเซอร์เวชิงเอน
mizi ju dewa stam tangi ina <hesitation> karsi wore kora ta kere tanga soro wajita ta kanje <hesitation> peushungi ta dege kapsu jazo nusu ta dege gi kora la ta tanga ta dege di shira chik chik tukja ro chik cha desha ta kora pe cheng yesam ba tanga hatu kuma su kora gi ta chongol hamu dewa ta kanje tuk pa lo pamu ro chik tuma yoro samu dinge samba ine nge gi samba la lo je shira di nganzu gi <hesitation> karsi wore ta nda pa du <hesitation> dende gi cha tanga dende piu gi mindu di kapsu kuni chok sam kapsu ne cha tanga piu mindu la <hesitation> ta chisu tsenje buli di ta kura ngi <hesitation> di shawi gi cha di kal tanda ngazu mangu chik ta ke cha shego orta cha tanga piu be ki diplomat maso ne cha ta chika tsibi tsibi kwa ligi dunia samlo tangi ena <hesitation> ka cha kura mi se gi dende gi kalo orta ene lo chung da chung da dende ke chiyo marde ene kura ndi kapsu tsuba tsu tanga da nzu da hang sa yare sha di <hesitation> jomi go bare sha ta ene tanda sha langazu <hesitation> Pebe gi kira boni ta mina mangu shu chik ngatsu gi ani tsa shi ni buzi gi orte lo je shada di si nyere ji yona na ba sung yue ni lo je shada gi juba tanda kenyi yue puhu puhu ni zu kenyi yue kwa yu shu yore dinde doa ta kanje ta ine <hesitation> dinde gi ta chap si gi ni tanji wala <hesitation> du sin shi re ta <hesitation> ngarang gi shim ju chi ni chuk dum kari je gi sun na lo je shada di kanje <hesitation> pebe gi diplomat tsa da chik re shas di di tesong kura mindus <hesitation> ta <hesitation> rangze ta di ge di ta kanje <hesitation> ngarazu gi chosom gi chaa gi chosom gi kongbo bari yosi gi re yimba ine <hesitation> ngarazu gi di kap gi netang ta wure <hesitation> ma ni yoma roa ma ma ngi mi ni yoma roa ma ngi mi tepsa yori yoya ta <hesitation> di ni pije tunda ngas yos chik zing ma ina so wure wune kura ta di tempa rangre <hesitation> shemba nyon tewa chik yoma roa Ngarazu ngarazu kapsa ngarazu 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 Lakja te roshi, lakja te roshi, lakja te roshi, lakja ma te na song roshi, song roshi, song roshi se jinya re. Inji ki katu te na ti si te roa, men ta sum to ta diu nga to diu katu nji yoe ta te, ta ti dangwa che aro ji kia ma kia so bet kia so ki <hesitation> she di te mi ki ma ya yung kudu che na kia so lakja ko kudu la ya ti te es roa. Ti ya zo wa la mo to i peshung ki uzu je du ya inji shung ki ma te, ta ti ma te ti peshung ki ya ta shi se woro wa, uru so ta ja ben ta da ma te na lakja le yung kudu wa, ti lakja le yung ya inji inji te som ke. Inji tesom kene ta ya o ta ngazu gi dilakcha dumha tewana ya shemba ngazu gi tewa ta chi ngazu ni ngacha gizun ya lakcha ti iste roa ti chukut sai mundu arms <hesitation> traffic convention gi ta ngazu lakcha zong ma chue gi ta ngazu gi ji gi ya tim din yoro a dende gi yune inji la tamja shukchum shi dado a lakcha ti te la ta dende gi tonde ngazu ta ngi ta ngazu zong ngi shukut ni di ta ngazu ngazu la mang mini yoma rai ani dewa ni chi gi yoma rai ani ta ani rangze yi la ni Ija jik duk sini tamba samki ija di <hesitation> kasu wari <hesitation> ngui ta ngui zin chitu wuri wai di ina jin ija jik tamba samki mi shi magi ngui zin chitu wuri wai di <hesitation> samun tanga jitri shasam gudu lo starai Nasi <hesitation> 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 <hesitation>
老三个的头的也不是那种事但老几种两种人在这里谁知道这三位我是忙着送的老几种不修了老当当的路了嘛给他们的嘛他的考核都太多了是吧老几种太多了你种你种太多了你种的话太多了你种的话太多了你种的话
This one? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, so it involved the three parties, right? Yeah. So that time there was no conflict about or no question about why Tibet is there from the Chinese? No, like, like, I think like... Um, in terms of trade, the Chinese were not that... Uh, how do I... What would be the correct word? Protective in that sense. Like... They, in a way, acknowledge that you know trade is um, uh, perhaps is in the Confucian thinking. Uh, you know, like uh, trade is okay. That you know, if you can develop uh, through commerce, it's okay. But as soon as it comes to the ground about territoriality, which in a way uh, is cast a doubt on the sovereignty of uh, China, then they are very, very aggressive. They are always very protective. Otherwise, trade and all. Um, they don't really mind. So this is, I think, the Chinese kind of uh, Confucius thinking, uh, which I must say, I'm yet to read a lot of Confucian thinking, and as I read more, I think I will understand it more, uh, how they think. And because the China is a very, it's an enigma. Everybody is trying to understand China. Nobody is like able to say with definite, definite, you know, answers, give any definite kind of answers. How they conduct their foreign policies, how they conduct their diplomacy, you know. But at the end of the day, the fact remains today that China is a power next to the United States. And perhaps uh, if the trend goes along this line in 2030, uh, it will become the economic number one economic power. And, uh, and uh, even further, perhaps down the line through the end of this century, well, there's a very good chance they will become the number one power, uh, maybe. But you know, anything can go wrong. But I think, like uh, again, uh, coming back to your question, Professor, uh, I think uh, the Chinese thinking is very, very territorial, and it's, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, it's a very strategic thinking, and anybody who wants to understand China has to understand the Chinese Confucian thinking and the strategic thinking. And uh, I must say, admit here, uh, I haven't read many of those, uh, which I hope to do so in the next two years with my contract with TPI, and perhaps at the end of two years, I might have a better answer. I think like the with the Yangtze, uh, where the boundary was, there was again like after this uh, convention failed, uh, in order to bring uh, uh, the uh, to get the Chinese consensus, uh, there was a lot of uh, talks of trying to establish where the frontier is, where the border is, and it was like a suggestion of. Uh, the Yangtze uh, River demarcating uh, the uh, frontiers, but um, but the fact is, uh, again, um, it never uh, reached any sort of a consensus, and uh, in a way, the British were not happy with that. Uh, so that is what uh, I understood from my readings. Uh, the British were really pushing for this uh, model. And the Tibetans were happy with that at that time, especially Lunja Shada. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it in, term, in terms of Chinese thinking, uh, this really pierces the territoriality concept. Actually, my question is a uh, little bit simple. The Shimla Convention was supposed to be a tripartite convention. And the three participating nations took part in the convention with their own motivations and uh, goals to achieve. And at the end of the convention, Chinese representative did not sign the uh, final document. In a sense, that convention was a failure. Mm -hmm. Then what made the British and the Tibet to go ahead and stand on those dotted lines? <coughs> yeah, so again, like this is, uh, there's a lot of legal ambiguities in this convention. That's why the whole problem of where the India-China border is, right, legally, you cannot really define it because uh, it is like a, a conference which in a way failed. Uh, the Chinese government never accepted it. And uh, I think like uh, as we uh, have to re again uh, recall the difference between frontier and border, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, frontier is a very vague concept of territory, and border is where you define it legally. 
So the problem right now with India and China is whether you want to define the border or not. The Ch Indian government, I'm, uh, as Professor uh, Bhattacharya mentioned, it is willing to settle this once and for all and move on. But the Chinese, again, uh, is, n is not willing to uh, settle it. And as many of the uh, sinologists have observed, they always have this tendency of procrastination. And uh, they will try to procrastinate it as much as possible uh, because it raises this difficult question of uh, you know, uh, how was Tibet able to uh, sign this uh, convention? Because if, uh, if they accept this, then there are a lot of implications legally in a way. Uh, you, you might have to accept some sort of, uh, some degree of uh, independence that was there, uh, if not full sovereignty. And again, uh, it, it, it impacts the legitimacy of the uh, CCP. And uh, I think if, um, the Chinese agree to this, I think you know, legally uh, they, they will be on the upper hand uh, with India in that sense. But again, uh, they um, uh, right now, you know, they are on top, they are the uh, leading power, and uh, according to, to, to their discretion, they will call the shot uh, when they are ready. Uh, but the interesting thing again here is like, this is very interesting article by Professor Martin Frevel. Uh, regime insecurity and uh, international cooperation, uh, you know, in which he says uh, the Chinese have resolved 17 out of their 23 uh, territorial conflicts, uh, out of which now the only remaining uh, uh, territorial con uh, land border conflict is with India. And uh, when the Maoist regime was insecure for its, uh, in its uh, regime, they did, uh, Tao and Lai, in a way, did uh, offer a territorial swap between uh, India and China. But uh, uh, from my understanding, uh, that was at the time when the regime was trying to esta establish itself. Uh, but by the 80s, uh, they have already become on a great uh, power road. And uh, so uh, it's an enigma when they will uh, call the shots again, perhaps when they are weak. Oh, what is their strategy? I don't understand in that sense. And I'm trying to dig into it, and maybe I will have answer later on. Territorial population, leadership, and language in the Jawa, the Jawa, and Langa Punira. I want to gain a real and a touch of the Shemira. Karishu is in a territorial capital to the Mata Niman Karishu is not popular. Two point five million square kilometers to square kilometer to the Yorla. Any little language and something that I don't want to get a look in the Tanga to Nation, but get us soon just on my Tanga Jayura. Population and not a six million, not lawyer, whoever the Tunisia to Magisha, key in another language here. And then about Toma, you get you get a little Mata Niman around the Yomari Lana, you tell Nango never the Kimbe to the Kandis. No, the two of us are two. Can I give some of the candidate the statehood criteria? Say today. Statehood criteria, uh, Savegi, uh, Bullis, uh, Shay Dana Red, and Sako, Mima, Shung, and that, uh, Digedi, uh, only because of, uh, Wang Se Lenzo. Statehood criteria, the Kisi, uh, Shi Shawina, only Taiwan, the Tanda in the Ranzing Gurua, Tanikarangi, Chagi, Shi, Timon, Shi, China, Taiwan, and the Shung Yore. え、コラズミセイヨレ、コラズミタネ、シュンギチョンギヨレ、ケスディチャゲシデシャギイナ、台湾でランゼロワ。チェザ、サウェギタンゲ、え、ディシュドチュ。え、チンギブリヤ、
내당 어디 스테이트 직 믹스에서 차트면 누, 아주 내신 들어와, 들어와. 다니 그런 게, 다 내신 더 스테이트 니디 게 컨셉 등 니디 그 생태인 거죠. 아, 자기들 생태 빼, 양가 신부를 한디 빼면서 원욕을 해요. 아주 간지 단대 아주 기 계직이 무리야. 삼 단계 있는 내신 스테이트 라이드 게 웨스팰리언 시스템 그 보다 이나, 아주 더 스테이트 후기 크라티레 디 내신 기 크라티레 강의 제 요마래. 텐데 레기 다 디기 돈을 쓰이나 스테이트 후기 강의 치기도 강했으나. Uh, state of criteria the internet that the uh, this year shot a territory government population they get so idealist declarative state theory because it was not get in a degree as Tim Newton is state dress guys now music said the much is the music said the much is the recognized leisure or did the chapsigi and it uh cause what quadric now chapsigi like that you're asking what the recognition day is a political act lower and he ये महीने रहा कॉन्स्टिट्यूटिव थ्योरी दी खर्च वर्ष ना दिनी नियम तो दुगुर है खर्च ना गेजे की डलम दिया समझ दिनी नियम तो दुगुर मशी की को लॉस चुपु जी की दो छवि वो मरे ऐसे कोर छह साल तक आज भेबे तो ने कैसे समझता ने दिक तंग ये दिकलते ही तंग आज खवाल ठुंगु दोते हुए ना Kerja ini cakap sih dah tim dinya mana dulu lah, sangat terdetan. Terdetan tu tu, tanda Oppenheim tak khusus kita kerja recognition di si Google es, recognition di mewah na, ani di statehood mara es segon di syukur mesti rasa boleh. Tapi Oppenheim khusus tu untuk pek tak kerja siapa tu sahaja di jere dah. Tapi ini, tapi ini kaya sendiri, tak kari ini mana? Tanda cakap lah ya, kerja zaman ini sahaja khusus tu yang ini. Amerika ini kerja statehood. Tanda ngaju ki share jorwa di music cikor. Amerika ki, sungki tak kaji cuma tu tangan tu tadi na declarative status di music cikor. Ina zaman ini gekap sih mana tu ki cikir bes share jorwa. Cikir orang itu, mana tu ki cikir orang mardi. Rawa. Tapi pensah sih na. Tapi mungkin perlu sah dah demas sih na. Okay, jadi pensah tu tu sih sah dah. Kosovo ni dong gel ni dong gel ya koran tu rangsen declare nang rawa ni dong gel declare nang orang gel ya tanda kau tu rangsen gegar berwes lana rawa kau tu declare nang re rangsen gegar berwes lana tanda rangsen gegar cai omar re kerana tanda kau tu recognition di rangsa tanda gu dia recognition rangsa gu macam tanda tanda gegar samling gi gegar pesen ni ambil jazoh gegar tanda jadi kau tu kau gel cikgu orang di bawah ni tanda cakar lah si kau tu tanda ni cikgu orang so kau tu ni Amerika ni kau tu jor Amerika tu nampak gi tu gi kelain cikgu re recognize dia ini mana ah ini mana Kosovo orang cakap na kanje Serbia ni mat katen dojo dojo itu Serbia ni kene macam bodoh kos state cakap yang mana ni di gaji tim kita lagu or tapi ni cakap na ngaju tu cakap na tak kisah ngaju pribadi di tak ngaju na okay state or kriteria sangat tu ngaju ngaju declare cikir na digi or ini declare cikir ini orang tapi tu recognize cikir eh sejor wa di kalau aku cakap orang tapi Lumba sama susu tu kebenar tak kira? Kebenar tu apa ina? Ani Amerika tak khusus dah ucap sih na, pasal kena cikir dah sama dengan sama. Tak kisah ngaco jauh mana rata dia. Ini jaga tu kalau khusus dah re. Jaga kisah di cikir na koran suki nyorah nyorah suci cikir orang. Koran suki Kashmir nyorah yor eh, lor. Atau Rusia lah koran suki Chechnya nyorah yor eh. Tak kisah ni dek tuan eh, cawe tak kisah khusus di shung ke tuan eh, ribet shung ke tuan eh, kalau sih na macam ni, so orang yang kalau suci sih na, tu sah cikir tu tu, mana kita top setingal. Mak itu top di Europe na, susu rangling rangi le Europe na re, susu le jamsa Europe na re. Tadi tadi situ na, jauh tuh esjor tadi. Pencahsih na, tanda Crimea re, Crimea roj, tanda kita dana roa. Crimea de reference tu macam ni dosa apa Rusia bola. Kaya na susu kan kecik tu pun doa. Kaya na Rusia yang jauh langit orang. Tadi, mana ni tu ni cikgu orang, mana mak itu top di Europe macam ni dah gugur orang. Tapi kalau le pebe gitu cikgu na, mak itu top susu roa cikgu re esjor roa. Tadi teh teh sum cik tu, ani kesi tap kah ten doa ini. Tanda gigi gigi tim gigi bun gigi gigi cakap si dua tahun cuma cuma ya, jangan sungi kelir macam itu, rangsi rangsi cakap gigi macam ni. Di di, tadi nak kerana gigi cewa nama show ni ngadu, show ni pasti insta ni ni, di show ni dia si kaya si nak gigi dua sembuh tu, lepas tu aja na. Once again, thank you Nogila. With this, we have come to the end of this session. I thank you all for attending this presentation and I hope you found it very informative. Uh, last but not the least, I request Kongo Papa to propose a word of thanks. Kongo Papa